Welcome back to Deep Learning. So today we want to talk about unsupervised methods and in particular we will focus on autoencoders and GANs in the next couple of videos. And we will start today with the basics, the motivation, and we will look into one of the rather historical methods that is the restricted Boltzmann machines. We still mention them here because they're kind of important in terms of the developments towards unsupervised learning. So let's see what I have here for you. So the main topic, as I said, is unsupervised learning. And of course, we start with our motivation. So you see that the data sets we've seen so far, they are huge. They had up to millions of different training observations, many objects, and in particular, few modalities. Most of the things we've looked at were essentially camera images. There may have been different cameras that have been used, but technically, typically only one or two modalities that were in one single data set. However, this is not generally the case. For example, in medical imaging, you have typically very small data sets, maybe 30 to 100 patients. You have only one complex object, that is the human body and many different modalities from MR to X-ray to ultrasound, and all of them have very different appearance, which means that they also have different requirements in terms of their processing. So why is this the case? Well, in Germany, we actually have 65 CT scans per 1,000 inhabitants, and this means that in 2014 alone, we had 5 million CT scans in Germany. So there should be plenty of data. Why can't we use all of this data? Well, these data are of course sensitive and they contain patient health information. So for example, if you have a scan that contains the head in CT, then you can render the surface of the face and you can even use an automatic system to determine the identity of this person. There's also non-obvious cues. So for example, if you have the surface of the brain, the surface is actually characteristic for a certain person and you can identify persons by the shape of their brain to an accuracy of up to 99%. So you see that this is indeed highly sensitive data and if you share whole volumes, people may be able to identify the person, although you may argue that it's difficult to identify a person from a single slice image. So there's some trends to make data like this available, but still you have the problem even if you have the data, you need labels. So you need experts who look at the data and tell you what kind of disease is present, which anatomical structure is where, and so on. And this is also very expensive to obtain. So it would be great if we had methods that could work with very few annotations or even no annotations. So I have some examples here that go in this direction. One trend is weekly supervised learning. So here you have a label for related task. And the example that we show here is the localization from the class label. So let's say you have images and you have classes like brushing teeth or cutting trees. Then you can use these plus the associated gradient information like using attention mechanisms and you can localize the class then in that particular image. So this is a way how you can get a very cheap label, for example, for bounding boxes. There's also semi-supervised techniques where you have partial or very little data of labels and you try to apply it to a larger data set. So a typical approach here would be things like bootstrapping. You create a weak classifier from few labeled data, then you apply it to a large data set, and then you try to estimate which of the data points in that large data set have been classified reliably and then you take the reliable ones into a new training set and with the new training set you then start over again, train a new system and you iterate until you have a better system. Of course there's also unsupervised techniques where you don't need any label data and this will be the main topic of the next couple of videos. 
So let's have a look at label-free learning and one typical application here is dimensionality reduction. So here you have an example where data is on a high dimensional space. Here we have a 3D space actually, but we're just showing you one slice through this 3D space and you see that the data is rolled up and we identify similar points by similar color in this image and you can see that this is actually a slice through a 3D space and the manifold that you see here is often called the Swiss roll. Now the Swiss roll actually doesn't need a 3D representation so what you would like to do is automatically unroll it and you see that here on the right hand side there the dimensionality is reduced so you only have two dimensions here and this has been done automatically using a manifold learning technique or dimensionality reduction technique that is nonlinear and with these nonlinear methods you can break down data sets into smaller dimensionality. Now this is useful because the smaller dimensionality is supposed to carry all the information that you need and you can now use this as a kind of representation and what we'll also see in the next couple of videos is that you can then use this for example as network initialization you already see the first outer encoder structure here that you train such a network with a bottleneck where you have a low dimensional representation and later then you take this low dimensional representation and repurpose it. This means then that you essentially remove the right hand part of the network and replace it with a different one. Here we use it for a classification and again our example is classifying cats and dogs. So you can already see that if we are able to do such a dimensionality reduction and preserve lots of the information in a low dimensional space, then we potentially have fewer weights that we have to train in order to approach a classification task. And by the way, this is very similar to what we'd already discussed when talking about transfer learning techniques. You can also use this for clustering and you already seen that we are using this technique here in the chapter on visualization where we had this very nice dimensionality reduction and we zoomed in and looked over the different places here and you've seen that if you have a good learning method that extracts a good representation then you can also use it to identify similar images in such a low dimensional space. Well this can also be used for generative models so here then the task is to generate realistic images so you can tackle, for example, missing data problems with this and this then leads into semi-supervised learning where you can also use this, for example, for augmentation. You can also use it for image-to-image -image translation, which is also a very cool application. We will later see the so-called cycle gun where you can really do a domain translation and you can also simulate possible futures let's say you use this in reinforcement learning so we would have all kinds of interesting domains where we could apply these unsupervised techniques as well. So here's some example for generation you train with the left hand side and then you generate on the right hand side those images. So this would be a very appealing thing to do that you could generate images that look like real observations. So today and in the next couple of videos, we will talk about the restricted Boltzmann machines, as already indicated. They are historically important, but honestly, nowadays, they are not so commonly used anymore. But they have been part of the big breakthroughs that we've seen earlier, for example, in Google Dream. So I think you should know about these techniques. Then later we'll talk about outer encoders, which is essentially an emerging technologies and kind of similar to the restricted Boltzmann machines, but you can use this in a feedforward network context and you can use it for nonlinear dimensionality reduction. You can even extend this to generative models 
like the variational autoencoders, which is also a pretty cool trick. And then lastly, we will talk about general adversarial networks, which is currently probably the most widely used generative model. And there's many applications of this very general concept. So you can use it in image segmentation, reconstruction, semi-supervised learning, and many more. But let's first look at the historical perspective and probably these historical things like the restricted Boltzmann machine are not so important if you encounter an exam with me at some point. Still, I think you should know about these techniques. Now, the idea is a very simple one. So you start with two sets. One of them are the visible units and the other one are the hidden units and they're connected. So you have the visible units V and they represent the observed data. And then you have the hidden units that capture the dependencies. So they are latent variables and they're supposed to be binary. So they're supposed to be zeros and ones. Now, what can we do with this bipartite graph? Well, you can see that the restricted Boltzmann machine is then based on an energy-based model with a joint probability function that is P of V and H, and it's defined in terms of an energy function, and this energy function is used inside the probability. So you have one over C, which is a kind of normalization constant, then e to the power of minus capital E of V and H. And the energy function that we're defining here, this E, is essentially an inner product of the bias with V, another bias and inner product with H, and then a weighted inner product of V and H that is weighted with the matrix W. So you can see that the unknowns here essentially are B, C, and the matrix W. So this probability density function is called the Boltzmann distribution, and it's closely related to the softmax function. And remember that is not simply a fully connected layer because it's not feed forward. So you feed into the restricted Boltzmann machines, you determine the age, and from the age you can then sample Vs again. So the hidden layer models the input layer in a stochastic manner and is trained unsupervised. So let's look into some details here. The visible and hidden units form this bipartite graph, as I already mentioned. You could argue that RBMs are Markov random fields with hidden variables. And then we want to find W such that our probability is high for low energy states and vice versa, and the learning is based on gradient descent on the negative log likelihood. So we start with the log likelihood, and you can see there's a small mistake on the slide. We are missing a log in the P of V given theta. So, but we already fixed that in the next line, where we have the logarithm of one over Z and the sum over the exponential functions now we can use the definition of Z and expand it. And this allows us then to write this multiplication as a second logarithmic term. And because it's one over Z, it's minus log the definition of Z. And this is the sum over V and H over the exponential function of minus E, the energy function. Now, if we look at the gradient, you can see that the full derivation is given in reference 5. But what you essentially get are two sums here. And one is the sum over the probability of H and V times the negative partial differential of the energy function with respect to the parameters minus the sum over V and H times the probability function v and h times the negative partial derivative of the energy function with respect to the parameters again. And you can interpret those two terms as the expected value of the data and the expected value of the model. Generally, the expected value of the model is intractable, but you can approximate this with the so-called contrastive divergence. Now, contrastive divergence 
works the following way. You take any training example as V, then you set the binary states of the hidden units by computing the sigmoid function of the weighted sum over the V's plus the biases. So this gives you essentially the probabilities of your hidden units. And then you can run k Gibbs sampling steps where you sample the reconstruction v tilde by computing the probabilities of v given h, again by computing the sigmoid function over the weighted sum of hi plus the biases. So you're using the hidden units that you have been computing in the second step and you can then use this to sample the reconstruction v tilde. Then this allows you again to resample h tilde. So you run this for a couple of steps and if you did so then you can actually compute the gradient update and the gradient update for the matrix w is given by eta times v h transpose minus v tilde h tilde transpose the update for the bias is given as eta times v minus v tilde and the update for the biases c is given as eta times h minus h tilde. So this allows you then also to update the weights and this way you can then start computing the appropriate weights and biases. So the more iterations of Gibbs sampling you run, the less bias the estimate of the gradients will be. In practice, k is simply chosen as 1. You can expand on this into deep belief networks and the idea here is then that you stack layers on top. Again, the idea of deep learning, stack layers on layers, so we need to go deeper. And here we have then one restricted Boltzmann machine on top another restricted Boltzmann machine. So you can then use this to create really deep networks. And one additional trick that you can use is that you use, for example, the last layer to fine-tune it for a classification task. And this is one of the first successful deep architectures, as you see in reference 9, and this sparked the deep learning renaissance. Nowadays, this is rarely used anymore. So deep belief networks are not that commonly used anymore. So this is the reason why we talk next time about autoencoders and we will look then in the next couple of videos into more sophisticated methods. For example, the generative adversarial networks. So I hope you liked this video and if you liked it, then I hope to see you in the next one. Goodbye.